Well, Landing International, it's a B2B technology company that I founded in um, 2016 uh, for the beauty industry. Uh, my background, I was actually bo- born in South Korea, and then I grew up between um, Korea and going back and forth from the U.S., Uh, I went to university in Boston and I had my first job there, which was also my first experience with a startup. And it went public during the time that I I worked there. So I had a positive interaction, uh, my first interaction with startups. And I guess I kind of got the bug uh, because I never really went back to work for a company. I uh, ventured out on my own and I was a, a consultant to beauty brands um, in in New York for over a decade. So I worked with many brands that were expanding into retailers like Sephora, Nordstrom, Bloomingdale's. And the nature of my consulting was um, actually around fundraising, how to raise money to buy the inventory to launch in these different channels. And at that time, which was early 2000s, the Indie beauty was um, growing for the very first time because prior to that, there were very limited channels. So for a small brand to go into department stores, it was very cost prohibitive. But uh, Sephora launched in the U.S. in 1999 and then other channels like Ulta started. And with the open store format, it allowed smaller brands to be able to afford to launch. So there was a huge, um, I think, a lot of activity around it. And I did that for, um, you know, about 12 years um, in New York. And then I uh, eventually, you know, had the, um, you know, idea for landing. Uh, How did you come up with the business idea in the beginning? And what was aha moment for you with the founding of Landing International? Yes. So, um, so as I mentioned, actually, right before I started landing, I uh, started a cross-border consultancy helping U.S. brands um, that I was working with um, in those past like 12 years to launch in Asia. And as I was doing that, I realized that this area uh, of international cross-border work is very manual and it's very relationship-based. And I think I have a little bit of like um, David versus Goliath, uh, you know, kind of chip on my shoulder where I really always root for the underdog. And it seemed to me that only the brands who had uh, relationships and who had network could succeed. And so um, and this was around the time that, you know, on the consumer side, there were so many technology startups helping really, you know, shorten the, the geographical distance. And so I started thinking there must be a way to use technology to help brands to launch into new markets. And that was kind of the, the idea for landing. And that's how we started, which was with the marketplace product. Got you. What problems are you solving now? Um, the problem we're solving today, I think, has more to do with what happens once you're in retail. Because we've spent the past um, you know, eight years helping brands to launch in retail, and we've had many successes, but also a lot of failures. And I think it's because once you're in store, it takes a tremendous amount of expertise and um, market know-how to stay in store, stay on shelf. And so we're solving that with our new mobile app, which is called Beauty Fluent, which is uh, an educational tool for retail associates. Uh, I look at the description of your business model, and which it says, Landing International, a, a B2B business tech, a technology company providing web and mobile tools help the beauty and wellness brand connect yes. with the buyer and succeed at retail. Yes. That's easy to understand, but uh, I know that a lot of professional service companies provide this kind of manual services, mm-hmm. customized mm-hmm. solution to the customer, but you are lo- you are running a startup to scale the business. So mm-hmm. I cannot imagine how it works, right? So can you tell us what is it? I mean, what is the business model? Yes. So our business model actually is quite simple. We're a software as a service company. So we have two levels of subscriptions. The first is premium, which is uh, basically all of our web-based tools. And that helps brands to meet with retailers, but also to share their product information with the retail associates. And then we have a level above that, which is our uh, web-based 
subscription. Uh, sorry, our mobile uh, offering subscription. Got gotcha. you. Uh, we we all know that we are living in a very challenging time due to the pandemic. Are you trying anything new to deal with the situation for your business or for customers? Yes, I think um, for well, just as a founder um, and CEO, the way that we're growing the company is quite different than it was pre-pandemic because I think we're in kind of a mental health crisis, and so I think the way that I lead is quite different than I think two years ago. And um, recruiting has gotten a lot, you know, more difficult. And so I think really identifying like what the business stands for has become quite important. And culture matters a lot to people who are making the decision to join your team. Uh, in terms of the business uh, and our products, you know, we I think in store uh, education has become more difficult because retailers are not allowing brands to go into the store as frequently. As they were before, there's a lot more limitations on testering because of like sanitary issues, um, and so I think it's really just kind of on the product side confirmed for us that this mobile app education um, tool is. Important and needed now more than ever. Got you. Um, in, in my previous life, I uh, was engaged in finance investment activities. So I met with a lot of uh, good company entrepreneur of the good company, large groups in Asia or as well as in Europe sometimes. But every time I feel that. Uh, a, a lot of Asian companies that are good at the manufacturing, they are not, I mean, really good at the growing the brand. We haven't seen mm -hmm. many great brands in Asia, unlike the France. Italy yeah. or US, right? So what is your advice to a CEO of a retail brand in Asia or in Korea with, with respect to the brand building? Mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest difference that we saw with um, brands um, from Asia is that they're not good at uh, targeting a specific audience. Because if you think about, let's say, Korea, the audience is very similar. They have very similar sort of, you know, desires and lifestyles you know, there's an age range, but, you know, mostly people want to have white skin and they want to, you know, look dewy. But in the U.S., there's such a wide range of lifestyles and customer groups that when you try to appeal to everybody, you ultimately appeal to no one, um, particularly when it comes to beauty, because beauty is a decision you make based on emotion and, and, and sort of like um, how you want to be seen in a way. So I think my advice for Asian brands, for um, Korean brands, is to pick a very specific small part of the customer demographic and target them very specifically. Because the good thing about the U.S. market is that it's so large that brands you have never heard of are building huge businesses. And um, it doesn't have to be a household name, but there are you know really great opportunities if you can really hone in on who is your you know, customer that you can uh, create a loyalty around. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I think Asian company good at the manufacturing and process designing to improve mm -hmm. the uh, productivity and efficiency. But when it comes to uh, brand building and targeting demographics, uh, Asian pretty look pretty much the same, right? We have the same similar yes, product, yeah. product, but when you think about the black guy or the mm -hmm. white American, European, mm -hmm. they have a very different preference for yes. the product and then the needs, right? Mm -hmm. So Asia was a big enough and then US market is a big enough for, I mean, some uh, similar demographic or the geographic market, but the, when you want to expand the growth the business internationally, as you just mentioned, they need to uh, try to, I mean, address all different diverse needs of the uh, market and customers. Yeah. Okay, let's move to the fire questions. Okay. So you can answer me in the last than 60 seconds. Uh, what is your favorite book and why? My favorite book is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, because I think it was the first business book that really helped me yes. to change my behavior. <laughs> What is your favorite blog or podcast you read or listen to most? Um, I have been listening to uh, SaaS Marketplaces podcast because I think it's like very relevant to what we're building. What are the three tools and products you can't live without? My phone, Slack, and my baby monitor because I have a 10-month-old. Okay. Yeah, phone is Apple or Galaxy or the 
Xiaomi. Yeah, Apple. You have <laughs> Apple. Okay. Yeah. Have people have a huge loyalty to the Apple brand. Yeah. And Apple too. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. one piece of the advice you want to give a founder with the new brand who is starting out business. Uh, mm-hmm. But having a lot of experience at a large company with the established brand, mm-hmm. um, I think I've actually met quite a few of those type of founders. And yeah, I think I when imagine. you come, yeah, I think when you come from a big brand, you take for um, you take for granted that you put out a message and everyone takes it because you have big budgets. But when you have a small startup budget, I think you really have to think of it like you have to win your customer one by one in the beginning. Until they become a repeat loyal customer, and then you develop a, a following, and that following helps you to create your. Really, they decide who your brand identity is. So, I think the difference between coming from a big company where the brand identity is already established to a small company is that you need your customers to help you to know, you know, what your brand is actually. Yeah, I think. I I I experienced I witnessed a similar situation a lot in the other industry as a financier or um, investment world in the investment world. That's a huge gap. They have a different yeah. skill set. I mean, they have a different asset actually. They, mm-hmm. If they can connect, connect and bridge the, the two different assets, maybe they have a good potential. But looks like it is a very challenging gap. Yeah. Right. Okay, let's finish it today with the big picture. What is the next five years for you and vision for the landing international? Um, I think five year vision for landing is that our you know mobile app, which is also a community um, for uh, the retail professional, that it is you know the most thriving and engaged beauty community and beauty associates, hairstylists, makeup artists. Um, all know that it is the go-to app uh, whenever they're seeking um, development in their career or to engage with other people like-minded. Thank you. I enjoyed the conversation and great to know about uh, ambitious uh, ventures. And thank you so much for taking time to share your great vision on my podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.